Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Glad you're with us. I see some other people coming in, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so uh, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, this particular uh, webinar series is entitled Discovering Natural Strengths and Struggles in Yourself and Others. This is an inter another interactive webinar with Lee Ellis and Hugh Massey, who are with you this morning. And this is really a two part or three part series that we're doing related to the release of their book, Leadership Behavior DNA. So today we want to drill down deeper on this idea of strengths and struggles and the nuance and the perspective of why focusing on strengths and struggles are both important. So Lee and um, Hugh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us this morning. I'm going to unmute your audio so you're you're ready to go. And before, I want to, I'll do a, also do a quick introduction of both of them. So uh, if, in case you're not familiar with them and you're a guest for the first time with DNA Behavior or Leading with Honor, uh, Lee Ellis is a nationally recognized leadership coach, award-winning author, certified speaking professional, and a colonel in the U.S. Air Force, retired, and our former Vietnam POW, where he shares his story around the world uh, related to that experience. And then uh, Hugh Massey is a CEO, Global Human Performance Accelerator, Behavioral Insights Pioneer, Entrepreneur, keynote speaker, mentor, and board member, and president of DNA Behavior. To get, Lee and Hugh have both worked together for many years, and that led ultimately to the, their latest creation, uh, which is the book Leadership Behavior DNA. So good morning, gentlemen, and I'm going to bring you up full screen, and we'll just get started. How does that sound? Good. Well, yeah, so I have a series of questions for you uh, related to strengths and struggles. And so uh, the first question is, so many authors and other assessments solely focus on strengths, and we hear that a lot. Uh, why is capitalizing on strengths while managing struggles so important? It's a key, uh, it's a key thing in your book. And uh, so wh why is it important to both capitalize on strengths while manage struggles? Thank you, Kevin. This is Hugh. The, the, the first part to addressing that question, I think, is to look at why so many other people out there, whether they're leadership uh, experts, authors, ass assessment developers, focus on strengths only. And it's positive to focus on strengths. And we're in a world where we want to deal with positive psychology. We want to make people feel good. We want to make people feel empowered. But if you only talk about strengths, in some ways it's also soft because you're not getting people to uh, address all of the areas of their performance. We're not getting them to address their, their derailers. And so someone who just uses their strengths uh, will at times overplay their hand in that particular, in that particular strength and somewhere it becomes uh, the truck hitting the wall or becomes a train wreck. And, and, and I think from a culture of developing people, we need people to own up and identify what their strengths are, but they've also got to identify what their struggles are and own up and address those and, and work on them more. Uh, and it's too soft to only focus on the strengths. Yeah, that's very true. And in my coaching work, you know, almost every time we have to get into the struggles, in fact, always, because other people are seeing them. And if you're developing as a leader and other people are seeing areas that are undermining your leadership and you're not aware of them and you're not dealing with them, then it undermines your, your role, your influence and your trust. So a quick example was uh, I was coaching a guy who was a VP of sales in an organization uh, in a Fortune 200 company. And he had all the, everything you'd want in a salesperson but it was on steroids a little bit, but in the staff meetings, he would kind of take over. He would start talking about stuff, start promoting, start selling. And no matter what subject came up, he would jump in on it. He didn't have any ability to rein himself back in. He was overdoing his strengths of promoting and selling and, and presenting his ideas. And so as I saw this and learned this, I was able to coach him. And so a couple of months later, he called me one day and he said, guess what? And I said, what? He said, one of the guys came up to me after the meeting today and asked me, was I feeling okay? And I said, sure, why? And he said, because in the day staff meeting, you were, you were acting so different. You were acting um, under control and 
it really made the staff meeting go easier and we thought you might be feeling bad. He said, oh no, no, I'm, that was intentional. I'm now aware of some of my issues and I'm working. So that really uh, strengthened him with his team because he was kind of sabotaging some of their staff meetings with his strengths being overdone. Yeah, and I think just to add to that in a, in a personal story that, that I experienced for myself, uh, when I was much younger and I didn't understand any of this and had no training in human behavior, and I was working in Arthur Anderson and I got uh, an early promotion to being a manager uh, there, where, which meant you really have to start uh, leading people, guiding people, bringing other people on. But I got the promotion because I was great at pumping out uh, the hours and billable hours. I was able to negotiate with the clients, the fees, uh, extremely rational in the way in which I delivered tax advice, uh, did good research. And, and in a way I could push myself towards the goals very quickly because I'm an extremely goal driven person. But what I didn't understand when I became a manager was the train wreck a little bit that got left behind at nighttime when, when I left the office and there were all these people also going home crying because they dealt with you. And you know, at the, at the end of the day, that, that isn't satisfactory. And I didn't really like it much when people did that to me above me. And, and so, you know, that just leads to a, a, a bad work culture. So it's not acceptable for someone to say, well, these are my strengths. And it's okay for me just to operate that way and to not understand how they're impacting somebody else. Yes, it all comes back to that self-awareness. Yes, we do need to know our strengths. We do have to rely on our strengths. And as a manager leader, you need to know the strengths of your people. And you also need to expect the struggles that go with them. So that self-awareness that allows you to see both. We call it the both in the book. We talk about the two sides of the coin. One side is the strengths, one side is the struggles. They always go together and they're so predictable. And you know, we haven't changed our list of strengths and struggles in many years and we get no pushback. It's amazing how in our workshops, how people take ownership for both their strengths and their struggles and they see the value of coming face to face with those. And those are also validated by their teammates. So. I think, and in this whole process, one of the things that happens is when people own themselves of who they really are, their trust goes up. It's being vulnerable. And when you're vulnerable like that, it's a powerful thing, actually, because you're being genuine and people love to be around somebody who's genuine. And I think that we want to be clear about one thing. We are still a believer in strengths. Yes. We are still a strengths-based organization and feel that's important mm -hmm. uh, for uh, selecting the role that someone works in, becoming more productive. But also in teaching people to become more self-aware, sometimes you've got to do it through showing them the struggles and, and allowing others to, uh, to expose them. And that's, that's very important. So in the overall self-awareness development, growing a person in their identity, who they are, becoming a better performer, managing people better and emotionally, we've got to show both sides of the coin, as Lee's been saying. Yeah, and as a leader manager, Probably the best thing, the biggest mistakes I ever made was putting a person who didn't have the talents, who didn't have the strengths for the particular job into a role. And they could make me look bad in a real big hurry. And it wasn't because they were trying. It was they just didn't have the right strengths to go in that role, in that position. And I learned the hard way about that as a, as a squadron commander in the Air Force. And then I can say, though, that... I was successful in my roles because of people around me who had great talents and I allowed them to use them to the fullest. I trusted them. Yes, I managed them. I led them and all that. But the reality was they were good at what they did. And so I mostly tried to stay out of their way and listen and uh, just give them some big high level guidance and boundaries and let them run with it. And uh, they made me look good, made me successful. So again, to Hugh's point about strength, yes, we want to be in our strengths and using them, absolutely. And I, and I think just to maybe close down on this point, what, one of the things that we do when we coach people is we do focus on the strengths in the sense of, uh, you know, I always ask people questions about how they're using their strengths. Mm -hmm. And that keeps the conversation positive, but eventually in that conversation, it's going to come into uh, where the struggles are starting to come out. Right. And, 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 that person's in, and then that person's identifying for themselves where the blockage is. Yeah. And that gives us the opportunity to, in a very empowered way, talk about the struggles. Right. One last thing. It's when we do 360s with people, when they get 360 feedback from people above them, people below them, and their peers, uh, 
those uh, struggles are usually validated right there. I mean, you can almost predict what their 360 is going to say because they, their strengths show up and people really give them big pats on the back. But they say, hey, here's an area that uh, probably could use some work, and it's usually one of their struggles. Right, right. Yeah, great answer. And uh, thank you also for your vulnerability and just sharing your personal stories or your personal struggles. Uh, that's, a, that's a great example of leadership. So thank you for sharing those as well. Let's see what our audience thinks this morning. Uh, audience, I'm going to pull up a polling question. And I'd like you just to click on your screen, click your answer. We're asking in general, which is more important for personal leadership growth, a better use of strengths or more focus on managing struggles. So just Click your vote and we'll see how people are, what people are thinking, how they're aligning with Lee and Hugh's answer and what we're saying in the book as well. Yep, managing struggles is coming in. Yep, certainly can, yep. How do you see those results, Lee or Hugh? Yeah, we see those results, yes. So right now we're looking at uh, 71% are saying managing struggles and 29% are built on strengths. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would I would tend to agree with that. It's much, it, it takes effort to dig into those struggles and really deal with those, as you said, um, versus building on the strengths. And uh, Kevin, so much of that is based on the role of a leader. It's not the performance necessarily so much of doing a particular job, but it's the role of a leader or teammate because those struggles are usually the things that, uh, the ways that we get in our way in relationships with other people. Right, thank you for everyone for taking that poll, appreciate it. Um, let's go on to question two, and, and this relates to question one, obviously. Can you give a past example of a client that became aware of his or her strengths or struggles and used that to improve their leadership? They really became aware and then improved. Can y'all think of a example? Yeah, one, one I've been working with recently over the last six months is uh, as part of a board I'm on. I'm the, uh, the leader of the board, if you want to call it the chairman, uh, for, for simple terms. And I've got a, uh, a highly skilled board member who, 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 who plays a role, a very important role. He's uh, great at uh, working out the situation, what the problems are. Uh, identifying solutions, all of those parts are great. He puts more thought into it than anybody else. He's a, he's a, he's a reflective thinker. And he himself has been a great leader of uh, other organizations, but around stronger people, he doesn't want to speak up. And so he's a little bit shyer about uh, presenting those views to the group and what they think. And so, you know, what I've really been, you know, working on is encouraging him that it's important for the group that he speaks his opinion and that it's going to be valued. And, and that I know everybody else values what he has to say because everybody sits around saying that he's actually the best board member that we've got. But it's important that we create a relaxed environment. And that's what I try to do as the leader, a relaxed environment for him to talk, uh, give him time to do his research so that it is considered and, and we don't off ask him off the cuff questions. And if you create the right environment, uh, and encourage somebody uh, like this, and I'm trying not to use his name because I don't, I, I don't want that uh, um, out there for the world. But if you do that as a leader and you can manage everybody else so somebody else can rise up a little bit, you really are going to get the cream coming to the top in terms of the opinions of the, of the group. And, and I think this is very important, you know, for running boards or if you're uh, just a division leader or a team leader, is enabling all the voices in the team to come forward. Yeah, that's so true. And of course, uh, I gave an example, I think, in the previous uh, segment there about coaching someone who uh, wasn't, became aware and was able to adapt. And that person went on uh, from being the VP of sales in the division of this Fortune 200 company to being a VP of the whole area of, uh, in a Fortune 200 company. So he continued to progress upward. And we see that so often when people become aware and they start to manage themselves when you adapt your behavior in an area of struggle, you're not reinventing yourself. You're just in the moment adapting yourself, coaching yourself. And that's what we're always trying to get people to do is to self-coach. Yeah, and, and you know, with this man, I don't want him changing who he is yeah. because that, that would be wrong, that would be uncomfortable and we wouldn't get the best out of him. And you know, one of the strategies is that, that now when he's got to hold accountability meetings with people below him, you know, we, we have somebody who's a stronger personality sitting in the room with him 
-hmm. so that if, if a message needs just to be re, re uh, framed a little bit more directly, mm -hmm. they can do it. And he feels like he's partnered up with somebody to, to, to address the situation, but nevertheless, his uh, very considered opinion can come forward. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Good. An and, and so we want to ask the audience too, at the same time, have they experienced this before as well? And so this second polling question is really dealing with have you intentionally worked with this concept of developing strengths and managing struggles? Or is this a new concept for you? Go ahead and uh, cast your vote and we'll show those results in about 30 seconds. But have you intentionally worked with this concept? Many only many people have only dealt with a strengths only approach. And so this, this idea of managing strengths and struggles at the same time, is that, is that new or is it something you've, you've done before? Many of these are our friends and colleagues, so I know they've heard this concept before. So we're going to uh, we go ahead and end this polling so we can show the results. And so, uh, yes, we see, yeah, by and large, many of you, yes, but 87% have, have heard of this idea of developing strengths and managing struggles at the same time. So thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, your opinion there. Um, no surprises there, I don't think, gentlemen. No surprise there. Uh, I think people are becoming more aware of the need to uh, to develop both. And you know, Hugh and I have been preaching this message for many years now, and I think other other leadership consultants are too. And certainly, if you've worked with a coach, a coach is not going to be just coaching you specifically on doing more of what you're already doing well. So we do want to improve on what we're doing well, but uh, if you're going to grow as a leader you're really gonna to have to take on those struggles. And, you know, you know, we say if you manage your struggles, if you learn to adapt your behavior in the moment in one of those areas of struggles, others aren't gonna see it as a weakness. They aren't gonna, they probably won't even see it as a struggle. They won't know that you're putting a little extra energy in there to either speak up or to shut up. Now, uh, I'm one of those that has to work to shut up because I talk a lot. And so I'm, I have to coach myself to, back down and uh, hold the emotion, hold, hold back on some of those words. And it's a constant battle because my brain has run a thousand miles an hour and I got a lot of things I want to say. And uh, that problem will never go away. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you've developed, you've written an entire book on it so that you've gotten a lot of words out in the last year yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to remind everyone too, at the end of this webinar, we're also going to give you an opportunity to take the work talent support at no charge. And we'll have those instructions at the very end of this webinar. So we're talking about managing struggles, but this is a nuance of managing struggles. And so you talk about this in the book, gentlemen, what does it mean when strengths overused become struggles and how can a leader coach someone on this issue? specifically it's it's a it's a variation on the idea of struggles when strengths are overused so how what does it mean yeah i think it goes back to the story i used earlier where the guy was overdoing his verbalness and his willingness to jump into the situation his ability to be conceptual and share ideas good ideas but it was dominating the meeting so that would be an example but it happens in every every imaginable way uh, being too decisive and wanting to control everything and make every decision. Uh, there's just so many ways that you can almost take any strength and overdo it. Uh, and let's say you're an idea person. You have a lot of ideas. Well, we can't implement all those ideas. Uh, we can implement a few of them, and they're really good. They'll make us a lot of money, but not all of them. Yeah, I think in just to use a couple of examples in society, we talk a lot about being planned is very important, being organized, structured. But uh, even detail orientated is seen as important and sort of almost celebrated. But the struggle of that being too far that way and overusing it is that, you know, you can get stuck in the paranoia and fear of what you don't know. You can get too picky. You don't make a decision. You don't get on with it. And, and so uh, that, 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 and that can become very energy, energy draining for other people. You know, sometimes it's, it's enough to, to, to be close enough. And, and to keep on moving. And, and so that's, you know, that's one example. Another one is, for example, in page 181 of the book, we use a story there about a wealth manager, Kate, who, who, who builds up a business in, in wealth management. And she is great at going out and, and getting new clients, but she's not so good at uh, managing um, the, uh, the client processes and the systems and things like that that are needed. And so therefore she doesn't understand why there's client turnover and why there's stress in the office and why she's stressed. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and so again, uh, you know, it's, it's really a strength overplayed there of getting too many clients too quickly and not having the systems mm -hmm. necessary to manage all of that. And you're causing yourself more pain when you do that. Yeah. You know, uh, one came to my mind here, uh, we could take every trade and do this, but you know, people who are so nice and supportive and kind and helpful, well, they can burn themselves out trying to be nice and kind and helpful and not take care of themselves. And so they can also be concerned about hurting other people's feelings. So concerned that they don't hold them accountable. And then it becomes a real problem for the whole team and everybody's wondering, well, when's the boss gonna wake up and, and uh, you know, see what's going on here with this person who's not being a good teammate and when's the boss gonna rein them in and set boundaries on them and hold them accountable. So, you know, being super nice is a great and wonderful characteristic, but being nice in every situation, uh, overdoing that, it really uh, doesn't help anything. I mean, whether it's raising kids or whether it's uh, you're the CEO of a company or you're a first line supervisor, you have to also be able to be tough and adapt from being so nice. Yeah, and the other one that I see is a leader that comes up all the time, it gets in my face a little bit, is creativity. And that's the eighth factor that we talk about in the book. And that, uh, you know, being innovative and innovation is celebrated in businesses these days. Businesses are changing so fast. The, ad the environments are agile. They require people to be agile. And the creatives generally are quite good at dealing with all of that. And, you know, they're able to see a new business model, a new solution that's going on out there. But it can also become, if not managed properly, an idea a minute. Mm -hmm. And teams can get lost in what do they have to implement. Mm -hmm. And the, the innovative people don't see often that as a problem because they're not involved in the, in the implementation or the implementation is very uh, scant. And, and they don't, yeah, and again, they don't see the processes that have got to go on to get something done. And it comes very costly for a business. In the end of the day, the business is spinning wheels. Yep. Um, and there's a lack of respect then that comes in for the anchored people who are putting their hand up, the white flag up to say, hey guys, you've got to slow down here. We just can't get all of that done. And what idea is important, yep. you know? Yep. And so that's why employees or members of the team get scared when they see their boss going to a conference, right? <laughs> so you know, I, I had exact, I was coaching an Air Force wing commander on his uh, leadership behavior DNA report. And uh, he happened to be out of town the day we had the workshop. He got called to the Pentagon. And so we're talking along and I said, we got to the eighth factor and I said, you're highly creative. In fact, you're the most creative guy on your leadership team. And I said, so you probably go off to a conference and you come home with a whole notepad full of ideas. And he started laughing. And I said, what's, what's going on? He said, well, about two months ago, I came home from a conference and we were having a staff meeting and I had this pet and the guys just stopped me and said, boss, we cannot, you go off in these meetings, we cannot do all that stuff. You know, we need to figure out two or three things, but there's just no way we can implement all those ideas. So he thought it was, uh, it really, uh, the, the leadership behavior DNA assessment really affirmed what he had just heard a couple of months prior. Yeah, I think personally for me, it, it, I'm middle range on, on uh, creativity. So I do connect to ideas when I, when, when I see people uh, bringing them up and, can work on sort of, you know, putting two things together. The, the problem becomes with the risk taking uh, factor where my score, personally, my score is very strong in that and, and, the, and the pioneering. And in a way that gets me to push ahead on uh, creative things, maybe, you know, because I can see, okay, we've got to take a risk to move the business along. We've got to pioneer new ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it, th these things play their hands out uh, differently. And you, again, I personally, one of those ones have got to be careful that uh, others don't get overwhelmed or we're not taking too much risk as a business by getting too far uh, or too close to the ledge mm -hmm. um, when, 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 we're, when we're considering the next solution. Yeah, yeah that's right. And I, I think all of us can recognize that we have uh, the danger of overusing our strength. So that, that, that was a great answer in clarifying that idea. And so uh, we're curious about you, the attendee, have you ever had to coach someone to adapt their behaviors to overcome a strength and gain more balance in their leadership? If you'll see that question on your screen and quickly answer, and we'll share some results in about 30 seconds. 
but have you ever had to coach somebody about adapting their behaviors to overcome a struggle? Uh, whether it's your child or your colleague or your team member, uh, uh, you probably had an opportunity to do that. So yes, all of you. So we're, yeah, we'll go in in that polling. That's no surprise there. So yes, 100% of you have had to do that at some point in your life or career. So uh, this is just a reminder as well, we're going to take a quick Q&A session uh, at the end of their questions. And so if you want to click the Q&A button at the bottom of your panel, Zoom panel, and just ask a question, we'll address those near the end of this webinar. So gentlemen, the, the question now we're talking about is, is, is about the hiring process and how does this process really help with hiring team members or developing a winning work culture? Uh, I know that's a great need for many of our attendees and many of our clients, especially during a hiring process, how can we really use what we're talking about here uh, during that? Yeah, I can comment on that. In the military, you know, there's kind of a mindset and you're going through basic training or commissioning training or whatever, that everybody should be able to do everything. And to some degree, that's true. Uh, we're trained to do whatever we need to do to get the job done. But the reality is that uh, we all have different talents. Some are better at some things than others. And I learned that the hard way when I was a squadron commander, when I put the wrong guy in charge of the military version of the United Way campaign. We called it the combined federal campaign, but it was the same type of thing as United Way. Well, I put this guy who's a great pilot, a great instructor pilot, a wonderful person in charge, thinking, okay, well, this will be an additional duty. He'll do a great job. He does a great job with everything else but he was not a promoter. And so each week at the staff meeting, they showed the barometer or the thermometer and you know, where everybody was going to 100% of their goals and all this kind of stuff. And my organization was always the lowest and was climbing the slowest. And I realized that I, too late, that I put the wrong guy in charge of that because he was not a promoter, he was not a salesperson. And he just kind of handed out the piece of paper and said, here, fill this out and turn it in. And that was it. Well, he had them all turned in before I realized I had the wrong person in the place and it didn't work out very well. Now this guy, let's say, went on to fly some of the top airplanes in the Air Force. He was a fantastic pilot, but he was not a promoter, the kind of person you would want to hire for a job that called for promotion. The next year I picked a different guy, also an instructor pilot. And quickly we just went through the roof in our, uh, combined federal campaign fundraising because he was a promoter and he got people emotionally all fired up about it and they saw the value of donating to these different causes that we were supporting. So that was a big lesson for me. And then I remembered back also that, uh, that one of my captains was a squadron scheduler. He was a lieutenant and made captain and he was really a good scheduler. He was doing a lot of things, but he was excellent schedule. He was always planning ahead and so many complicated pieces. You had to have a system. This guy was really good. Well, this guy eventually was a uh, commander of Pacific Air Forces and the vice chair, the vice uh, chief of staff of the United States Air Force because he was both strategic and tactical. He had a combination of being very detailed, but also a visionary and he could put all that stuff together into a process and that was well rewarded in the Air Force. So looking back, I can see, identify those talents. And to, if you're in an organization and you have a scheduler who's not a good scheduler, you better get them changed out immediately to somebody who is a good scheduler. Yeah, I think one of, to build on what Lee was talking about, one of the biggest areas in hiring where, where there's huge problems is, is salespeople. Mm -hmm. And so often, uh, a, a person that's good at talking, uh, presents well, looks like, you know, they look good. They show up at the interview and they can charm the living daylights out of you uh, and talk you into a role. And then you get them performing a role and you realize they're not that good at closing. Yeah, they love talking to people. Uh, there's great energy in the office. They're great at standing at a booth at a conference, but uh, they can't do the hard bits that are required for sales. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what is important, you know, when we get down to sales and the hiring process and using what we're talking about is also to understand the definition of the role and what is required for the role. So what is a salesperson in one business will not be a salesperson exactly. in another business. Uh, what is, you know, a relationship manager uh, might be great at connecting people and, and doing customer service work, 
but they're not going to be great at mm -hmm. uh, enterprise sales where they've got to go hunt and gather right. and, and be involved in tough, tough conversations that can get strategic uh, or, or going to Greenfield. So, you know, understanding all of the talents required for a role right. is really important and what the gaps are in the business right now are important. So, you know, the, hiring is pretty strategic at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to look, you've got to look at the corporate culture, uh, all the people you've already got on the bus, where are the gaps? And, uh, you know, how much of certain types of people do you want versus others? Right. And, and one of the things that's really important is, can this person go work alone? I was working with a company out in uh, the Midwest and they, they had lost a guy, but we had, he had taken our assessment prior to he, him leaving the company. And as I showed them the, on the screen, the scores, and I, we had done some training and they looked up and the guy shook his head and said, we should have never sent him to Nashville by himself. <laughs> he, he, it didn't take long for him to catch on that with this information, if he had known that, he would have never sent that guy off by himself to operate by himself. Some people are not good independent operators. They work well with a team. They need a support team around them. They're, they just don't work well. And other people are just the opposite. They are not the best at being a, a collaborative team player. They work better when they have more uh, their success depends more on them working alone. Yeah, so I think the, the, the process and the framework we have really helps you see the whole person holistically yeah. and, and brings out the truths. And right. it's part of getting them, you know, in the hiring process, the, the person being hired to own their truths and also for the leader to own their truths as to who they need. And, and it's important that leaders just don't hire themselves because they're sick of dealing with the differences. Yeah. And that's a big part of what we talk about in the book is dealing with differences. Yeah. yeah. You and I have also been talking a lot more about identity and uh, what we're really doing is helping a person really understand a big chunk of who they are. When we talk about the leadership behavior DNA, we're talking about a big part of their identity, especially for work and relationships. And when, as a leader, the more that you can help that person uh, develop and operate within their own identity and then affirm them in their identity, help them connect their identity with their dreams, the more powerful it is. And, you know, part of my whole life, uh, adult life experience, at least in the last 30 years, has been freeing leaders to lead higher. So I want the leaders to get free so they're so vulnerable and genuine, they can help others to get free so everybody keeps climbing up. Yeah, and Lee, over the 19 years I've known you, you've never changed that message. You, you might think you have, but it's always been about liberating people yes. in the self-knowledge of who they are to help them rise up. And, you know, for me, uh, doing more work, more and more work on, on my identity, and I really looked at it, where am I having the maximum impact on other people? Mm -hmm. and, and other people and a positive impact, of course, and a maximum impact from the business. And, you know, I found that uh, it's very closely related to my pioneering mm -hmm. uh, strength. And that is way out there off the, off the Richter scale in terms of strength. But, you know, it, and, and the risk taking, it brings it home why I've done a lot of work on the forefront of uh, behavioral finance, mm -hmm. you know, using the systems that we have and why we're, we're also talking about money and, lead, you know, and how leaders are impacted by money, uh, which it brings into play everything we've talked about today, but extra features. But I think when you get rooted in the profile and what your greatest strengths are, your identity is sitting pretty close to them. You know, you just said something that rang a bell with me. Uh, Hugh came from Australia about 2001. 2001. 2001, yeah. he flew from Australia to Atlanta to sit down and talk with us about just to come and it was such a pioneering thing. He went west, young man, he went west. He went from Australia to Atlanta to sit down and talk with us about assessments and to uh, start working toward behavioral assessments for application in the financial investment world. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as a life story, I came over here with my, uh, with my overnight bag. I met with Lee and uh, Lee gave me a dress down on my strengths and my struggles straight away because he, he, he already knew my, my report. And then we got off to, okay, well, that's uh, um, took me back a bit for a second, but then I connected to that. And, you know, ever since, once I realized who I was, I had the, I had the empowerment that I had to follow through on what the dream was yeah. and that I would be left unfit fulfilled I would not be fulfilled if I'd never followed through on the dream. Yeah. And, 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 and knowing what my strengths were, I knew that 
deep down I could do it. It was going to be hard along the way and I was going to take some, uh, some kicks in the guts and, uh, you know, there would be struggles or events that happen, which, which have happened. But if I didn't do it, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be good enough for life. And therefore, there would be regret. And, but it's understanding those strengths helps you decide whether you're going to play that game or not. So what percentile are you on pioneering? So I am right out there. I've got a T-score of 80 oh, on pioneering and 78 on risk-taking. So uh, you can imagine, for me, uh, you know, it's masked a little bit by extreme introversion, so people don't always see it coming. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is something that I have to manage every day because I am so extreme, Lee, as you know, that sometimes I don't see the pitfall uh, as quickly. Or if I am seeing the pitfall, I can get too conservative with it too at times mm -hmm. because I'm overplaying, uh, being cautious to protect myself against what might happen. And so that's that's the constant life struggle. That's why I use a coach. That's why I have you and others constantly giving me feedback so I keep that balance. Yeah. Uh, you know, this whole thing we're talking about, it's really it's so powerful to be able to coach yourself and have that self-awareness so that you can fulfill your identity. And that's really a big part of our goal is just helping people be all that they can be and fulfill their dreams. And, uh, you know, that's a great mission in life. And when a leader sees that opportunity, it's not just getting the results, but it's also helping those people advance and move ahead. Uh, that's a powerful, powerful challenge, a powerful mission, but it also has a great and powerful legacy. I agree. I agree. And that was a great answer. And, it's undeniable that understanding strengths and struggles during the hiring process is vitally important, regardless of the role or who you're hiring. Uh, we have a great question from Raymond Hendry, and it relates to what you've just been talking about. And he says, so much of what you address is really about blind spots and behavior, but how much of becoming aware of behavior is linked to habits. If you become aware of blind spots, are you changing habits and behavior at the same time? How much of how much of becoming aware of behavior is linked to habits is what he's asking. Well, I think so much of um, our DNA is so flows through us so natural. It's swimming downstream. Okay, if you're outgoing, it's swimming downstream to go to a, a party and meet a bunch of strangers. There's no challenge. It's fun. It's like plugging into the socket here and getting you all charged up. That's swimming downstream. So it's almost like a habit. It comes naturally. But to be in a meeting and hold back and be quiet and let other people talk or maybe ask a question and sit and listen, that may be more of a going against the habit and adapting your behavior. I think the whole focus of this book is about learning to when to adapt your behavior so that you can lead and manage yourself and lead and manage others to be the most successful. Yeah, I think a habit is the outworking of the, the well, you can have positive habits, you can have negative habits, but I think the habit uh, is something that is a that is an outworking of the behavior. It's closely it's closely interlinked, and if it's a negative habit, if you're not aware of, of the struggles and, and and how that's playing out, then it's going to be hard for you to change uh, the the actual habit itself. Right. So here's the thing. I think all the brain research shows that the brain is the most uh, wants to be efficient, and it develops habits to be effective and efficient. So it uses the least amount of energy. Okay, so habits can be very, very good. The problem, and think of swimming downstream as being the easy way, going with the flow. The problem comes uh, when we have a habit that we're, it's not effective. It's get, we're getting in our own way because we're exercising maybe a struggle or something that is not producing positive uh, results for us and others. And there, we're, if it, the habit is already installed, well, then we got to work against the brain's desire to go this way because it's kind of got that path. It's been going the, down the wrong stream, you might say. And how do we get out of going down the wrong stream that's a dead end back up here into the mainstream so that it can flow uh, in a better way? Yeah, and I think in this conversation, and a lot of it we've said today, but we want at the end of the day, keep the person uh, working downstream using their, using their strengths. Mm -hmm but we don't, we don't want the, the struggles becoming derailers, which they do if they become a habit or allowed, in fact, to go further and become uh, the weakness. Yep. Now, what's the way out of all of this at the end of the day is if you are aware of your purpose in life, your identity, uh, you know, the bigger goal for you and the bigger mission as Lee used uh, 
just a minute ago, then you can start to work on shaping yourself up to eliminate some of those uh, habits, which might become derailers and get in the way of you succeeding. Yeah, and I think going back to the identity thing, if you decide that this is the kind of person I want to be, and that's a very important part of identity is who I want to be and what I want to stand for, then this knowledge and information gives you uh, tools to become more of who you want to be. This person who does know how to relate to people, who does know how to encourage people, who does know how to hold people accountable and set boundaries. If that's your goal in life, then this is going to be able to help you do that. You're going to be able to see it in kind of a scientific way. And that's what we tried to do in the book is saying, okay, we kind of, we all know that people are different. We know that, uh, you know, sometimes differences irritate us. If you're an outgoing person and you're with somebody who's real reserved and they don't say much and they don't compliment you and they don't notice when you're doing something good and out people, outgoing people love to be noticed, see? But when the reserved people just sit there and ignore them, all of a sudden the outgoing person starts to think, well, what's wrong with them? Why don't they notice me, okay? So these are the kind of things when you become aware of those, you're able to interpret those situations in a in an objective way in a meaningful way and you're able to give the other person the benefit of the doubt you're able to give them the credit they're just being who they are this is not about me yeah i think just uh, you know lee used the word objective part of the process we have is to lay it out there objectively it's not not doesn't come out judgmentally or with criticism yeah it is it is who you are naturally mm -hmm. and it's there then laid out for you to work on and that's really there are no shortcuts with that that's for each person to go and do. Yeah. And, and this, the whole concept is underwritten by science of statistics. And, uh, you know, I think every, everything out there shows uh, how our DNA is different now. And uh, there's just, we're at, a, we're at a place we weren't 30, 40 years ago and being able to understand. In the book, we talk about the two networks in the brain, the task positive network and the social uh, network and how those work against each other and how hard it is to do both at the same time. It's virtually impossible for the brain. These are uh, fMRIs, uh, MRIs of the brain, showing that if you're focused on a task, you're not gonna be able to give positive feedback to somebody if you're solving a problem. You will have to pause and focus to do that. And for a highly results-oriented person, that takes a lot of energy. That's, that's not their normal habit. So yeah. we're helping them to see that there are certain things that leaders have to do. And if you're going to be a good leader, then you're going to have to do both. You've got to have the relationship side where you're connecting with people, lifting their heart, lifting their energy and their emotions, lifting them up, but also the side over here that can be tough and set boundaries and hold them accountable. And, you know, I've never noticed a, a leader who is respectful, kind, and developmental of their people and also tough. People love that. They don't dislike a leader who's fair and tough. They like being around that kind of leader. So that's kind of a big part of the message we're trying to communicate. And I think that which brings us back right uh, to the start of the, the webinar, Kevin, and the discussion is that's why you just can't talk about strengths because that, that's just leaving it all too soft. You've got to be able to talk with both sides. It's got to be uh, some toughness, but there's also got to be some fairness and understanding and compassion in the conversation. And if you talk about strengths and struggles, you bring all that to the table in a nice objective way, but the person will hear it and see it and understand it. But if you only talk about strengths, I think you're leaving too much behind. Right. And to go back to the, relate that back to the results and relationship, we talk about the seesaw. And if you're highly results oriented, then to get that better balance, you're going to have to deal with your struggles. Yeah. Okay. And if you're highly relational, you're going to have to deal with your struggles to get more balance so that you can be a more balanced leader. Yep. Yeah, I uh, have a friend who's a retired four-star general and he's a hugger. But I promise you, the people who've worked for him uh, will tell you that if you step over the boundaries, you will be standing at attention in front of him, <laughs> getting chewed out a little bit, inappropriately in the right way. And uh, this man is so wonderful because he had that ability. And recently, uh, just recently, I was with him and we were doing a workshop and he commented on this very issue. He said, you know, what I learned in leadership was the, the more I became a leader, the more I had to do of the things that I didn't come easy 
and the less I had to do of the things that came easy. In other words, I had to work less on my strengths and more on the things that I don't do well in order to balance myself out. And that was his whole self-coaching is the things I don't do well, I got to work on. And he had done a good job of it. Yeah, great example. Great example. And to circle back to Raymond's question too, it sounds like intentionally giving energy to managing your behavior inevitably affect, affects your habits. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about yeah. here. Yeah. So, yeah. So we need to wrap up, but we have one final question. You can touch on this and we can also direct it uh, after the webinar as well. John Morgan asks, can you touch on the importance of understanding how the unconscious brain is playing a significant role in your daily decision-making and how can stress impact your strongest behavioral factors in particular? So how can the unconscious brain play a significant role in your daily decision-making as it relates to behavioral factors? Well, I'll, I'll make a short comment and let Hugh jump in. He's a better thinker than I am. So the unconscious brain is the swimming downstream. Um, you take a, a, an outgoing person with a reasonable background in education, you could walk up to them and say, I'd like you to talk for three minutes on a skateboard key what a skateboard key is and how it's used. And I promise you they could stand up and do it, okay? There's no great conscious brain work here. It's like, it's just a natural flow. But there are other things you could ask that person to do and they would be scratching their head and, uh, and probably ready to dodge out and go out of the room. So I think that our natural DNA talents, our strengths, they just come so easily. Um, yeah, they're related to our instincts uh, that just come into play really in, in, in an unconscious way. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just what's naturally going on out there. And that, that's sort of you know, what I talk about a lot in, in, in some of the other work I do uh, with leaders and money is there's the automatic biases that people have that are really those, um, those instincts coming out. It's the unconscious behavior. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're under pressure, you forget to be conscious sometimes and it just there's that behavioral flip goes on the socialized behavior the learnings go out the window and you revert to that unconscious behavior a lot of the time uh, and that's you know that's that that that's a lot of what we're talking about here is but the more that you become aware of in a way what your unconscious strength and struggles and go-to positions going to be you've got a better chance of managing it in your conscious life right i give a quick example to close out so my particular uh, traits are, I am both take charge and outgoing. So outgoing is friendly and likable and wants everybody to like them. But my take charge, when the pressure is on to get results, to get a job done, to get a task done, I can get so straightforward and direct that uh, to some people it feels like I'm, uh, I have a hammer in my hand, I'm beating him over the head, and I don't even realize it, because I'm just saying, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this, bam, 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 like giving orders. And so I have to roll that back a little bit, uh, because it unconsciously takes over to get results. Yeah, I think it's, you know, a lot of it is, you know, we've talked about it today, we want people to be working in that unconscious behavior to, to, to a large degree. Mm -hmm but understanding the impact it's having on other people. Yeah. You know, when you're in a conversation with people is look at how they react. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good one. What are your own energy? Do you, are you picking up the fact that they might be resisting? You know, these are all ways that you can start to manage yourself. Yeah. Uh, and in, at the end of the day, did you get the result that you were looking for? And, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the awareness is to, is to, is to see these things happening. And it does get measured through human energy at the end of the day. The bottom line is, is to be effective. Effective in leadership, effective in relationship, effective in getting results, effective in building teams. It's all about being effective. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you gentlemen for your time. Excellent answer. And again, just a reminder about the book and we're gonna wrap up today. And also today we're offering the free offer of the Work Talents Report. So if you wanna know a taste of your own strengths and unique strengths and struggles, your top talents, how you can, how others can connect with you and manage your talents. This is one of our newest reports we have through DNA Behavior and Leadership Behavior DNA. So if you'll go to leadershipbehaviordna.com forward slash talents, 
you can take a complimentary version of this one page report. And so this is the one of the best things that we thought we could offer our attendees today is in, a, in the spirit of becoming more self-aware is to take the work talents report. So thank you again. Uh, thank you gentlemen for your time this morning. Thank you guests and attendees for attending. Uh, look for part three of our webinar series related to leadership behavior DNA and we'll send out invitations for those. So thank you again and uh, have a good day.